Hi there, my name is Marcus Collier-Wright. I'm co-founder and CTO at Neutron Star Systems, and I'm very happy to be here today to tell you about how superconductors can act as an enabling technology for high-power space missions. To give a brief overview of the content that I'm planning to cover, I'll start with an introduction on the topic and introduce high-temperature superconductors as a technology and where they are today in the global market. I will also then introduce what we call the non-dimensional Tchaikovsky equation, which is a way of analyzing orbital transfers for high power missions, which considers a lot of different aspects like the electrical power system mass, as well as the transfer time, and is a bit more accurate than the traditional rocket equation. I will then talk about some superconductor applications for space in relation to the uh, non-dimensional Tchaikovsky equation. And combining these two things together, we'll evaluate the impact of superconductors on mission architectures when we consider the savings on payload mass fraction which could be achieved. Finally, I'll wrap up with some key conclusions and takeaways from the talk. So starting off with superconductors. A superconductor is any material which exhibits zero electrical resistance when cooled below a certain temperature, known as its critical temperature. The first superconducting materials discovered over 100 years ago had critical temperatures of only a few Kelvin, which meant they had to be cooled down to very low temperature to exhibit superconductivity. And this placed ex extremely high demands on the cooling system required. Over the following decade, several new materials were identified as superconductors which had higher critical temperatures, but it was not until the 1980s when there was a significant improvement in terms of the highest critical temperature materials that were discovered. This was with the discovery of copper oxide materials, which had critical temperatures significantly higher than the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. And uh, in doing so, these superconductors had characteristics which meant they could be combined with uh, much more reasonably sized and reasonably powered cryocoolers. Now, over the following 40 years until today, these superconductors have seen significant maturation efforts. and They're now available uh, in the form of multi-layered tapes, like you see in the picture on the right. Uh, the various layers provide various different needs for the superconductor operation, such as mechanical stability and humidity protection. And, but in fact, the superconductor layer itself is only a few microns thick. Even then, these tapes are able to carry over 100 times more current per square millimeter than the corresponding copper tapes, which are used often today. The development of these tapes has been accompanied by a corresponding advancement in the manufacturing and production processes of these superconductor tapes. Thanks to the use of very modular and scalable manufacturing processes, such as electron beam physical vapor deposition, these superconductors can now be produced at industrial scales. They've reached economies of scale, meaning that they can be bought off the shelf at very cheap costs. And this has also led to a number of other benefits. Not only the cost efficient production, but the fact that this process is now well understood, meaning it's very robust with a high yield of tape uh, compared to the amount of materials being utilized. And as well as the fact that industrial standards have been implemented throughout the process, meaning that the quality and the consistency of the produced product is very high. What is also important to note here is that thanks to these advances, the supply chain for superconductors is now significantly strong. We have suppliers in Germany, in USA, in China, Japan, and in South Korea, and a global production capacity of over on the order of thousands of kilometers of tape per year. This means that they are widely available and, as mentioned, can be purchased at very reasonable prices. So the characteristics of superconductors, namely the fact that they conduct electricity without any resistance and can process huge amounts of electricity in a very lightweight and compact volume, means that they are very well suited for space applications. This is because they can replace traditional cabling with a much lighter solution, one which also has zero losses, but also because they can enable new applications which would not be possible with conventional technologies. For example, the generation of strong electromagnetic fields which need several hundreds of amps and which can generate fields on the, on the order of several tesla. Some of the applications are summarized on this chart here based on different magnetic fields and currents that are required, <clears throat> but they range from today's applications like power transmission lines, but also some novel applications like electromagnetic shielding or for cryocoolers or for other magnetic needs. In the next few slides, I'll go into some more detail on specific applications where they can be used. 
and what efforts are currently underway to develop these applications. However, before I do this, I'd like to contextualize the importance of superconductors by introducing the non-dimensional Tsiolkovsky rocket equation. And actually, we'll begin with the standard rocket equation, which many of you will be familiar with. This equation tells you for a given orbital transfer with a certain delta V and a certain propulsion system with a certain specific impulse, how much fuel you're going to need and what's going to be the ratio of your initial and final fuel mass. Now, when you look at this, you might think, well, we always want to minimize the amount of fuel we need. So then we should always choose the highest specific impulse propulsion option. That's not necessarily so simple. This is the case when we consider chemical propulsion, where uh, chemical rockets produce high thrust and low ISP, and the energy for this thrust is coming entirely from the propellant itself and the chemical bonds within the fuel. But for electric systems, it's not quite so straightforward. On the other hand, they produce a low level of thrust with high specific impulses, but most importantly, the energy which determines their performance is provided by an external electrical power system and not by the fuel itself. This is important when we start to consider the behavior of electric propulsion systems. And on this chart, we summarize a number of propulsion systems which exhibit a very common characteristic. That is, as you go to higher specific impulses, you have a reduced amount of thrust. Now, the issue that we have to pay attention to here is that it's not just the level of thrust on the left on the y-axis but actually thrust per power so here we start to see that there is ability to operate at both high specific impulse and high thrust but only if we provide enough power when we consider ambitious missions which need large spacecraft or need to go over a long distance then the only way to achieve both an economic operation with little fuel whilst also preventing very long transfer times is to go with high power electric propulsion. But now when we start to consider transfer times, the situation gets again more complicated. If we have a transfer time requirement, i.e. we need to move from one place to another in a certain time period, then we also have a thrust requirement, which we need to fulfill with our propulsion system so that we get there fast enough. However, if we have a thrust requirement and we still want to operate at the same specific impulse, then we're going to need more power in order to achieve this thrust. <clears throat> and as a result, we're going to need a more heavy power system because we need more solar panels, we need more cabling, we need more power conditioning units. All of this adds mass, which is not actually accounted for in the standard rocket equation. As a result, we need to consider the power system mass when we look at the rocket equation if we want to actually get an accurate picture of what happens at high power missions using electric propulsion. This is where the non-dimensional Tchaikovsky rocket equation comes into play. This accounts for the extra relationships between transfer time, thrust and power system mass to give a more comprehensive overview of how these parameters are related. And the equation displayed here, which can be derived from the basic rocket equation with a significantly long and arduous process, but for your benefit I'll just show you the final result. This relates the payload mass fraction, mu PL, to a number of properties which are dependent both on the orbital transfer, such as the delta V and the time limitation, but also the characteristics of the spacecraft and the propulsion system. In particular, the thrust efficiency, the exhaust velocity, which is related to its ISP, and also the mass specific power of the power supply system, how heavy it is for each watt that it produces. Now you can plot a curve of payload mass fraction against a specific impulse in order to assess for a given orbital transfer and a given set of technologies, what is the optimum specific impulse? And you end up with curves which look something like this. And what may be surprising is that actually there is not a benefit to just going to as high a specific impulse as possible, but actually there is an optimum point beyond which an increase in specific impulse will actually result in a lower payload mass fraction. Now, how can this be? Well, to understand this, we need to consider the transfer time. These curves are plotted for different transfer times for a given orbital transfer. And as the transfer time gets shorter, the uh, payload mass fraction gets smaller and the optimum ISP also becomes lower. And this makes perfect sense. <clears throat> if we need to go faster with a given orbital transfer, we need to go at a higher thrust. 
And if we want to achieve that higher thrust at the high specific impulse, we also need more power and therefore our power system is heavier. And beyond the certain specific impulse, the extra mass that you have on the power system needed to achieve that thrust actually outweighs the fuel savings that you can gain with a higher specific impulse. These curves have been plotted for an orbit raising of an all-electric geocommunication satellite from geostationary transfer orbit to geostationary Earth orbit. And as you can see, for the sixth month, uh, for the sixth month example, which is the commercial standard for orbit raising time limitations, the optimum ISP is at about 1,500 seconds. So this explains very well the popularity of Hall effect thrusters for such needs. Now, why is this important in relation to superconductors? This is because the shape of the curves and the optimum values are strongly dependent on the C parameter, which is the mass specific power of the power supply system, but also on the characteristics of the propulsion system. So if we can improve these parameters with the use of superconductors, we can, in theory, achieve higher payload mass fractions. So to explore this in more detail, first we'll look at some of the applications of superconductors for spacecraft. <clears throat> and the first one that is in mind is using them for power management and distribution. Superconducting cables have been widely adopted on Earth in several applications, like in some power grids, for example. And the benefit here is that they can allow more power at the standard bus voltage with a minimal mass and volume penalty because they can uh, process and manage the extra current that is generated. Some studies predict that as much as a 95% reduction in cable mass per unit length and ampere can be achieved with the use of superconductors over conventional technologies. In addition, superconductors could be used in power electronics, which are also part of the power management and distribution system, for example, for transformers, converters, or capacitors. And again, these have already been demonstrated in terrestrial applications where as much as 50% weight reduction has been achieved using superconductors. Another novel application of superconductors is for electromagnetic deployment and support applications. Here, the idea is to use the electromagnetic forces which are generated by superconducting coils to deploy and support various mechanisms and structures in spacecraft. And although this is a relatively low maturity technology at this point, the preliminary investigations indicate that it has a number of benefits over existing approaches for such needs. Of course, a number of challenges remain with integration and uh, thermal control. Nonetheless, this could be a promising application which may merit some further research. Another application of superconductors is in scientific instruments. On the left, we have an example where a superconducting current lead is being used to bring electrical power to scientific instruments. Some scientific instruments, like X-ray spectrometers, need to operate at extremely low temperatures on the order of millikelvin. Now, in order to achieve these temperatures, a complicated cryogenic cooling chain is required, and every extra source of heat significantly impacts the performance of these cryogenics. So with superconductors, we're able to replace a significant portion of the conventional conductor bringing electricity to the scientific instrument with superconducting cables, which generate no heat losses at all. And this means that we can significantly improve the performance of the cryogenic system and hence benefit the overall trade system trade-off for the scientific instrument. Neutron Star Systems is currently leading a contract to develop a similar superconducting current lead as in the picture on the left for the European Space Agency. Another application that's demonstrated on the right is the use of superconductors for magnetic spectrometers. And here, these instruments need to operate at high magnetic fields on the order of a number of Tesla in order to be able to perform their roles. And this is where superconductors come in, being able to provide these fields with few losses, with minimal power requirements, and also with compact and lightweight coils. Superconductors can also be used to protect spacecraft during re-entry by means of electromagnetic shielding. When a spacecraft re-enters a planet or a moon's atmosphere, the interaction of the spacecraft's large velocity with the atmospheric gases leads to a buildup in friction and also the generation of an ionized plasma around the spacecraft, which imposes high heat loads on the spacecraft and also leads to a radio communications blackout. The use of an electromagnetic shield can deflect this plasma away from the spacecraft, thereby reducing the heat loads and opening a window for, for communication to continue uninterrupted. However, this requires a field on the order of several Tesla, which can only be provided by a superconducting coil. 
This approach is currently being investigated under the NIST project, which has received three and a half million euros in funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 FET Open program, and of which Neutron Star Systems is one of the consortium members. In a similar manner, we can use superconductors to generate electromagnetic shielding for protection against radiation environment in space, which can be in the form of cosmic rays, high energy particles, or other phenomena. In this way, the superconductors can provide an active protection uh, for astronauts or sensitive equipment on board spacecraft. And this is something which has long been considered and was previously researched also under an EU funded project known as SR2S in 2015. Perhaps the most important and near term application of superconductors for space is on electric propulsion. And one good example is the applied field magnetoplasma dynamic thruster. This thruster is formed of two electrodes which are insulated each other and between which we feed an electrical voltage generating an electric field. We then feed a propellant gas in between the two and it is ionized in this electric field, conducting the resulting arc between the electrodes and generating what is called a self induced magnetic field. The interaction between the electric and magnetic fields leads to the acceleration of this plasma by means of what is known as the Lorentz force. And this is actually the most basic form of the magnetoplasma dynamic or MPD thruster, known as a self field MPD thruster. However, it needs extremely high powers and high currents to operate, which means that it is still some way from being applicable. In order to overcome this issue, we can enhance the performance by utilizing an external coil which generates an applied field in the axial direction. This leads to a number of further physical interactions, leading to two more acceleration mechanisms known as the Hall acceleration and the Swirl acceleration. This combination of features lends AFMPD thrusters to a number of benefits, such as the ability to operate on a wide variety of different propellants, significant scalability and throttleability due to a lack of dimensional restrictions, and also the fact that there is no external neutralizer required because the entire plasma is accelerated rather than individual ions. The scalability of the thruster can be demonstrated by the SX3 prototype, which is the most advanced prototype in the world, <clears throat> which is a 100 kilowatt class thruster, but weighs only 13 kilos, which is extraordinarily lightweight for such a high power propulsion system. The issue is that in order to operate it, you also need an electromagnet. At the moment, this is made of copper, and this weighs over 150 kilos and consumes close to 300 kilowatts of power for its operation. And this is the showstopper preventing it from coming to the space market. Nonetheless, the thrusters achieve very high performances with a long-term steady state operation, thrust efficiency is up to 62%. And I wanna highlight here the importance of the magnetic field. If we have a higher magnetic field, we're able to operate at higher efficiencies, also at higher voltage and lower current, which is beneficial for thrust lifetime. And most importantly, we can generate higher thrust and higher specific impulse values. So in essence, we need the technology to overcome the mass and power limitations of this electromagnet whilst providing higher magnetic fields. A perfect synergy with superconductors. Supreme technology, as we call it, is what we are now developing, which is the use of MPD thrusters with a superconducting coil which is located in the applied field module of our conceptual system architecture. And by incorporating the superconducting coil, we will be able to reduce the mass of the magnet by a factor of four, its power consumption by a factor of 300, and increase the magnetic field strength by as much as four times, leading to uh, improvements in lifetime and performance. So if we look again at our electric propulsion selection that I showed earlier in the presentation, here we can see that for various missions, we have different uh, systems which are useful for different needs. All effect and gridiron thrusters are highlighted in the uh, red and blue dots respectively as the two main technologies currently flying, but they're quite limited to specific ranges. With Supreme, we will expect to operate at the entire blue shaded area. And with this, we can be used for a number of different mission scenarios and offer significant flexibility to operate at the optimum ISP for the specific mission need. Now, to evaluate the impact of using superconductors, we took the non-dimensional Tchaikovsky rocket equation and applied it to a number of reference mission architectures, a one megawatt Mars cargo mission, a 600 kilowatt lunar cargo mission, and a 300 kilowatt near-Earth asteroid mission. 
for each mission, we evaluated the savings in mass that we could achieve with a superconductor-based system, as well as the improvements in efficiency and uh, propulsion capabilities, and plotted a number of charts looking at various transfer time limitations in order to understand how we could benefit the payload mass fraction for these scenarios. Starting with the Mars cargo mission, these were the curves that we plotted. With the dotted lines we have for the three transfer time limitations, uh, the conventional technologies, and with the uh, solid lines, we have the superconductor-based version. And what is clear is that we can achieve a significant increase in payload mass fraction, potentially as high as 7%, and also operate at higher specific impulses, which is beneficial overall for the amount of fuel that we need. Similar results were also found for the other mission scenarios. For the moon cargo scenario, the optimum ISP was actually even reduced, but again, the savings compared to conventional technologies were still significant. The reduction in optimum ISP came from the fact that the transfer time limitation was a little bit more strict, which meant that the impact of uh, using superconductors was not quite so much felt. The third scenario for the near-Earth asteroid <coughs> showed that uh, actually when we have extremely lenient transfer time requirements, then we can only achieve minimal payload increases. Um, and here only a few percent was possible because we had extremely long transfer times. But even with a few percent, the savings that can be wrought with superconductors are still quite significant when we consider that this could be a multi-ton spacecraft. So to conclude, the main takeaways from the talk that I want to leave here. Firstly, superconductors are now a very commercially mature technology. They're standardized, they have a very modular production process, and we can procure them at very reasonable cost thanks to the fact that economies of scale have been reached. This, in combination with their excellent benefits, such as low mass, compact volume, and 100% efficiency, positions them very well for use in space, and they are now at a level of maturity where it allows them to be considered and designed for space applications. Because of this, a number of applications are already possible, with many more being discovered as we go. The main important ones being for electric propulsion and for power management, but also for some novel applications like re-entry shielding, deployable structures, scientific instruments, and even radiation shielding. When we look at the impact of these superconductors, then it is clear that they have significant benefits on the mission level. We can enable a very high increase in uh, payload mass fraction just by incorporating this key technology for outer spacecraft. And in turn, this will also enable more advanced and more ambitious high power missions, which previously were not possible due to the limitations of conventional technologies. So I'd like to say thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I hope you found it interesting and were able to understand the immense potential of using superconductors in space, especially to realize how they can be significant enablers for ambitious missions like going to Mars. If you have any questions or would like to find out more, I invite you to get in touch with me. And if not, thank you once again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.